they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Now, last week, when we talked about the uh, aftermath of the hearing in Pilate's court, uh, which he held in Jerusalem only during the festivals, because he was otherwise never actually in Jerusalem, but in Caesarea Maritima, um, you know, the subject of the Gospels changed for the first time. Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, was no longer the main character, because all the action has transferred to a few collective groups, all referred to as they. The soldiers, the crowds, the chief priests and scribes are all referred to as they, and they are doing all the talking and all the acting. Yeshua is portrayed as merely the direct object of their actions when he's even really mentioned at all. Now, the focus right now is on the collective world of Jewish and Gentile forces coming together as a team to destroy the Son of Man. Yeshua will not speak again until verse 34, and no allies are mentioned until verse 40 when we discover that the women have not left his side. This is chapter 15, by the way. But right now, Mark is very much portraying Yeshua as a perceived pawn, a casualty. In the victory parade of the enemy through the actions of the, the oppressors that he's using. The author of Mark is writing this as though it's a done deal. As though Yeshua has been abandoned by the entire world and in, you know, in, in the next installment by God himself. This is the continuance of last week's triumph parade where Satan and Rome and the Jewish political establishment, which was the same as the religious establishment in ancient times. Um, you know, they've won a tremendous victory and have tortured, mocked, and paraded Yeshua as a captive of war and are now making him an example of what happens to anyone who crosses them. Sin and death have become the main characters of this narrative. And I apologize for sniffing and sniffing. I've been out gardening, and I'm also covered with mud, as I told the kids when I was taping that one earlier. Um, anyway, I am Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah, if you prefer written material. I have six years' worth of blog at theancientbridge.com, as well as my six books available on Amazon, including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it, called Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the link for those on my website, and past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com, and transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com. If you have kids, I also have a weekly broadcast where I teach them Bible context in a way that shows them why they can trust God and how he wants to have a relationship with them through the Messiah. And um, as of, what, two weeks ago, I am on just about every podcast platform that there is. Um, all scripture this week comes courtesy of the ESV, the English Standard Version, but... You can follow along with whatever Bible you want, as I am not... The Bible Translation Police. A list of my resources can be found attached to the transcript for part two of this series at theancientbridge.com. All right, uh, this is chapter 15 of the Gospel of Mark, as I was saying before. 
starting in verse 22, and they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And we talked about the site last week. I think we all know that almost all of the touristy sites were chosen so long afterward that they are a combination of guesswork and nonsense and wishful thinking, and very few have substantial archaeological backing. People want to visit shrines because it makes things feel more real and even when they can't possibly be correct. We uh, looked at Joan Taylor's work and her article, Golgotha, A Reconsideration of the Evidence for the Site of Jesus' Crucifixion and Burial, which is free online, and I will include that link again in this week's transcript. Um, you know, it, it covers her work. Um, she's an expert in Christian origins and Second Temple Judaism and incredibly respected in her field. She presents evidence that according to the very early church, Golgotha was not a place, but a region outside the walls of first century, Jew first century Jerusalem. And um, as per John, the crucifixion site um, and the burial site were both in Golgotha, but it doesn't specify how far apart they were. She believes that it would be more logical and Roman to crucify him along the roads as a deterrent and a show of Roman power. So the area south of the traditional site lies at the crossroads of two pilgrim trails into the city via the Geneth Gate, one leading from Bethlehem and Hebron and the other from Joppa. If Yeshua were crucified in this spot, it, would, it wouldn't have been on some secluded hill away from the roads, but it would be on a major thoroughfare, two major thoroughfares. As we see travelers passing by and mocking him, it does seem unlikely that it was not at the roadside. And in Hebrews, it's specifically stated that Yeshua was crucified outside the gate. That's Hebrews 13, 12. So it, it helps when visualizing all of this, you know, if you see it as not on a hill far away, no matter how much we love that song, but at the edge of an Iron Age um, stone quarry, which would have been Israel's monarchy period, that was the Iron Age. Um, you know, that was that that covered the region of Golgotha, that stone quarry um, that intersected two main busy thoroughfares into the city. And that's, you know, where they would have gotten the stone for the first temple, very possibly. Now, this wasn't secluded. This was as public as possible. This is what the Romans would do to a man condemned for sedition, for claiming kingship without Caesar's and the Senate's permission. Verse 23, And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. The only action Yeshua has taken since speaking to Pilate and then refusing to speak is the refusal of the myrrh-infused wine. In Mark 14, 25, Yeshua said that he would never touch wine again until he was in his father's kingdom. And it wasn't time yet, so he refused it. But there are a number of theories about this. You know, wine was the drink of kings. And at this point, he was not yet a king. You know, I believe that he officially became a king, not when he rose from the dead, but at the moment he overcame the enemy at his death. It was the ultimate surprise attack that the enemy never saw coming. Imagine if a king says to you, if you can fill this cup, then you can have whatever you want. And you look at the cup and there on the table and it's about a pint. You think, sure, you can fill it. But what you don't know is there's a hole in the bottom of the cup, draining into a bottomless pit beneath the floor. And the moment you take the challenge, you have already lost because you cannot fill that cup. Not in a thousand years. That's what happened when Satan killed Yeshua. He poured every ounce of his power and authority into the bottomless pit of Yeshua's innocence in an unjust act. And it wasn't enough. Satan lost as soon as Yeshua's physical body failed. Um, the proof and vindication came three days later um, that the victory had already been won, despite no one noticing you know, uh, Joah, Jonah went into the belly of the great fish guilty, whereas Yeshua was innocent. So let's talk about myrrh. 
Uh, myrrh, like frankincense, is a tree resin, and that is how they were used in biblical times, unless they gained the myrrh through plant injury. And then the liquid was described as tears of myrrh, because they would drip from the wounded plant. Uh, Pliny the Elder claimed that Romans loved wine perfumed with myrrh, which, oh, sounds awful to me. Um, Sanhedrin 43a, Babylonian Talmud, claims that a grain of frankincense in wine was given to condemn men as a narcotic by generous upper-class women. But... With the Roman soldiers, the only reason I could see for them giving him a narcotic would be to ultimately draw out the torture. Crucifixion might hurt less, but it would still be horrific. However, the text does not specify who gave him the wine. The pronoun isn't specific. They could be the Jewish women, or it could be the soldiers. You know, something that just now occurred to me is that this might have been a continuation of the triumphish mockery. The mention of the myrrh, which upper-class Romans wanted their wine to be perfumed with. Wine was known as the drink of kings, I already said that, and wine mixed with myrrh wasn't so much for common folk, who instead normally drank a vinegar-water mixture, which is the sour wine he is offered later. Honestly, it's all guesswork, you know, what Mark is saying here. And um, the reason we know it's... um Myrrh-infused wine is because of a Greek phrase that I am not even going to try and pronounce, but I have it in the transcript. And the reason we know it's different than the sour wine offered later is because, again, we have that specific cultural reference, that specific word that meant sour wine. Um, um, but re Yeshua refuses the wine for unnamed reasons. And so, yeah, again speculation abounds. Was it because he had refused to drink wine until he came into his kingdom? Or did he refuse to drink wine because he, he foreknew that the women would try to deaden his pain and he knew that he had to drink and experience the full cup, the cup that he kept telling his disciples that he had to drink? A drugged Messiah on the cross might make us feel better, but it would seem to be counterproductive. No shortcuts to salvation. Verse 24. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. It was uh, the job of four men. Four men would oversee crucifixions and they would guard the bodies until they were dead so that no one would come to free them. This would be the they... Who crucified, divided, cast lots, and and took from him. Again, it's like this story isn't even about Yeshua at all, but instead about the world's response to him. It's really chilling, you know, when you read it this way. You know, we've gone through 14 chapters where it was all about Yeshua. And he's been there and present and our only focus and then all of a sudden, it's like there is this world without him where he's, you know, where he's a bit player. He's scenery in the background. And, you know, and when viewed or heard aloud, as it would have been, rhetorically, this is a very alarming section of scripture. If, if we were not focused on his suffering, it would be as though he was already gone and all hope is gone out of the world. Yeshua seems to be at the mercy of these men, and in a way he is, but only because he has placed himself at their mercy in obedience to fully drain the cup of wrath. You know, his garments, which were famous for healing those who touch them, and that's in uh, Mark 5, 27 through 31, and uh, 6, 56, the woman with the issue of blood, and... Oh, why can't I remember the other one? Oh, well, doesn't matter. Um, anyway, they were now treated as, you know, his, these garments are cheated, treated as cheap commodities by the soldiers who had stripped him naked before nailing him to the cross. It's like a bunch of kids playing with their father's valuable coin collection, having no clue their value. 
and spending them on the ice cream man, okay? And it isn't that the clothing healed, you know, on its own or, or was intrinsically valuable. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about magic here. But they are absolutely clueless as to what they're involved in as they go about business as usual. Uh, we will cover the fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18 at the end because there is so much in this section that applies to that entire psalm. And I don't want you to think that this is unusual or that they saw themselves as thieves because this, you know, because this was somehow out of the ordinary. Tacitus uh, in Annals 6, 29 mentions that it was just part of the perks of the job, that the execution squad would receive whatever the victim had on them at the time, and the stake kept their property, if any. In the Babylonian Talmud 48b, oh, <laughs> I didn't put in the tractate. Ah, I don't know which way. It's probably Sanhedrin. I will have to put that in into the... Dang, what the heck? Um... Put that in the transcript. There is, anyway, there is this big long debate over who gets what belonged to the executed man. And it, and it made me, you know, want to rip my eyeballs out with a fork. You know, I just, you know, I hate nitpicking and all the legal wranglings. I would have made the worst lawyer ever. It's like, can't we just be loving and give the stuff to his family? Okay. But they didn't ask me, you know, Heck, you know, likely they would be horrified that I'm teaching at all because during the Talmudic era, women were considered to be good for very little other than serving men and having babies. And I'm not good at having babies, so, you know, there's that. I wouldn't be all that useful. Anyway, I want to cover a controversy that really shouldn't be a controversy at all. A lot of times people will get the idea that such and such is pagan or a certain thing is forbidden or not expressly forbidden and therefore fair game, and we get hopelessly sidetracked. Which is why Paul in Galatians 5 lists the fruit of the Spirit and specifically says that there is no law that stands in the way of being loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, generous, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. And he would have based this on the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, if we are countercultural in the ways that really matter uh, by saying no to sin and specifically oppression, then, you know, we do well. When we instead get involved in nitpicking and being just overly concerned with technicalities, we end up stunted and not growing at all. And ask me how I know personally. Anyway, um, years ago, there was this brouhaha about the cross versus the execution stake, and people were really adamant that Yeshua was killed either be, by being nailed to an actual tree or to an upright stake. And I believe the source of that controversy centered on the everything that the church does is pagan because I have this book with no footnotes that tells me so. And, you know, although people are quick to not believe one group's claims, they will read a book with unsubstantiated claims and decide it's true, which, by the way, is a big part of the reason why kids are walking away from the faith because parents are under the misguided assumption that blindly accepting an alternative na narrative just because is the same thing as thinking critically, but it isn't. It's no different than what they did the first time. I'm actually going to be speaking at a homeschool conference uh, in about a month where I'm going to talk about this because it's very serious. And anyway, so people were convinced that the cross was a pagan symbol and people were wearing it and the people that were wearing it around their necks were um, committing idolatry. Now, here's the deal. We know what crucifixions look like because they are described in detail in a whole lot of ancient sources, Jewish and Gentile. We also have archaeology backing up those claims, one of the most famous being the Alexamenos Graffito, carved into the wall of a boy's dormitory uh, within the Imperial Palace on Palatine Hill in Rome around 200 of the Common Era. Some poor kid named Alexamenos, who was a Christian, was being mocked for worshipping a man with the head of a donkey nailed to the traditional T-shaped cross, or not just to that cross-shaped cross, uh, because the Jews were 
accused of worshipping a donkey god. A great book on this is Hengel's Crucifixion in the Ancient World and the Folly of the Message of the Cross. I will have a link to that. It's a masterpiece written in 1977, and no one is revising it because it's just an amazing piece of scholarship, and sometimes they get it right the first time. Um, but we do, in addition to Hengel's um, book, we actually have a lot more archaeology now. So you could write an update, but you just wouldn't have to redo what he did. Uh, verse 25, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. I want to talk about the third, sixth, ninth, and twelfth hours. I actually did a Context for Kids broadcast on it, and I'll link that in the transcript because I took more time with them than I will with you. Don't worry, it's at the beginning, so you won't have to trudge through the whole thing. But in a time without clocks, there was a certain period of daylight hours that are longer in the uh, summer and uh, shorter in the winter. You know, well, however long that time period was, it got divided into 12 sections. Noon, the sixth hour, wasn't at 12 a.m. All right? It was whenever the sun was at its highest in the sky, directly overhead. Um, around now, you know, each of their hours would be about... An hour and a half, and, you know, in the coldest part of winter, each hour would be about 50 minutes long. At the third hour in the temple, the priest would open up the temple and perform the first tamid offering of the day, otherwise known as the uh, continual burnt offering, because they offered it twice a day, every single day of the year. And um, when the shakari prayer service was uh, offered, that was when they did it. This was when Yeshua was nailed to the cross. And gosh, this is, you know, such a disconnect. Things are going on over at the temple to the east. And it's just a normal festival day. Okay, again, this would have read to the believers in Yeshua as utterly surreal. As the first whole burnt offering of the day is slaughtered, Yeshua is crucified. And I want to share with you one of the prayers they were offering up um, from from the daily uh, Amidah prayers, and they, specifically the Shacharit, speedily cause the offspring of your servant David to flourish and let him be exalted by your saving power, for we wait all day long for your salvation. Blessed are you, O Lord, who causes salvation to flourish. I mean... It's ironic that as the priests prayed this, their leadership was destroying the very offspring they were praying for. And, you know, it says, let him be exalted. You know, let him be lifted up. And, and that's exactly what's happening. And that's what Mark is showing here by, by making reference to the hours. Um, you know, crucifixion was so horrifying and shameful that you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. The body of a Roman citizen was considered to be too sacred for crucifixion. You know, we also know that from historical documents that the victim was either tied or nailed to the cross. John claims that Yeshua was nailed, and unless the person was like really someone Rome wanted to be made a spectacle of, the cross was only seven feet tall, meaning that animals could come by and harass them, or worse. Anyway, Mark is the only gospel writer to make note of this happening at the third hour, but remember the story he is telling us. Yeshua is the rewriting, the retelling of Israel's Passover history. He is the leader of the greater Exodus, and not only that, but as he is that continual offering, the morning and the evening whole offering that remains before Yahweh for eternity. Each gospel writer gives a slightly different version of the Passover story based on what they're trying to show us and what facets of it they are needing to emphasize to give us the full picture. Be back in a few minutes.
Rosenquist, and welcome back to the second half of Character in Context. And this week we're we're in Mark 15, which is always a very difficult section to be in. And, and things have really changed um, once we got to 15. Uh, Yeshua is has gone from being the main character um, of his own biography to being window dressing, um, you know, a prop for what the world, you know, what the world is doing has moved into, into the front of the action. And, uh, they, the world, the different groups of the world, they are now the subject of the entire narrative. Yeshua is not doing anything. He's not saying anything. Um, it's like he's already gone. And we're experiencing, you know, the cruelty of a world without Yeshua. And we talked about, um, we've been talking about the hours. We'll talk about those, um, more as we, as we continue through the, um, the chapter. Let's, um, start up again in verse 26. And the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. This is the fifth mention of the phrase King of the Jews. The first three were from Pilate. And the fourth, when the soldiers were carrying out the mock triumph. Um, this would have been a wooden board, whitened with chalk and the charges written over that in ink. And the title, of course, is Roman. King of the Jews is a Roman title and not a Jewish title. This was Herod the Great's title, a title withheld from his sons, actually, who were just um, tetrarchs and ethnarchs. But I imagine this was a jab at the Jews, mocking them because they detested Herod, and with good reason, and they also hated his sons, and again, with just cause. They were looking for a Davidic Messiah who would conquer the Romans, not to have the title associated with a crucified man. Rome was, I, I believe, showing the Jewish leadership what they thought of them. Simon bar -Giora, um, who you can read about in Josephus' Wars of the Jews, was one of the ruthless leaders of the revolt against Rome in the years leading up to the destruction of the temple and much of Jerusalem. He was captured forced to walk in the triumph of Titus, who, you know, he was judged to be a rebel and a traitor and was executed in Rome. He, uh, he was actually thrown down from a great height and had been mockingly labeled the king of the Jews as well. Um, you know, this is, of course, is later. But, you know, but, you know, he did have it coming. He was horrific, horrifically brutal. Um, all of the leaders were. All of the leaders of the, uh, the revolt who, uh, were in the city just destroying the, the Jewish citizens. Um, yeah, innocent citizens of Jerusalem, they just, they, they slaughtered them and starved them and refused to allow them to leave and just, it was horrifying. Um, you know, the, the citizens of Jerusalem who thought that they were being saved by these rebels would have been better off ruled by the Romans. Uh, verse 27, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. First of all, I want you to remember that this gospel would have been read in one sitting. It would have been like going to a movie for these folks. And it takes about two hours to read this. They would have been hanging on every word. And so all of it would be fresh in their memory. And when they heard that the two robbers were on his right and left, they would have gasped because they'd be remembering the quest, the request of uh, John and James back in chapter 10, when they asked to be able to sit at his right and left when they, when he would come into his kingdom. Um, when they were obviously still thinking that he was going to be the type of Davidic Messiah that they wanted. I was teaching the kids about expectations today, and this was a big expectation. Uh, they thought they had it figured out. 
So here, instead of James and John, two robbers were judged more worthy to be there at the inauguration of Yeshua's kingdom. And the word for robbers here is listes. Um, and that is the word used for the social bandit, Robin Hood types who were, har were harassing the wealthy in those days and all the way up to the First Revolt, um, which took place between 66 and 70 of the Common Era. You know, truth be told, with the timing... They were quite probably associates of Barabbas, um, who hadn't been popular enough to have anyone hollering for their release. Lestes is also the word used against the chief priests when Yeshua clears out the sellers and the money changers. Lestes were quite popular with the disgruntled and oppressed population, but they were still nothing but criminals. Uh, verse 29. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And now we have another group of they. And this time it's, you know, it's not the soldiers or possibly the women who were um, giving Yeshua narcotic wine. Uh, but it's the people walking by on the two roads headed into Jerusalem from Bethlehem and Joppa, coming in for the day's festivities. The word for derided is blasphemo, which is interesting because that was the formal charge from the high priest in formal hearing, you know, when all was said and done that he deserved death for the sin of blasphemy. But here's the deal. Yeshua was convicted of blasphemy not for the charges of de temple desecration because they couldn't make that stick, but because he had dared to tell the high priest that they would see him coming in the clouds, which was judgment language, and to stand in judgment of Israel's leaders in those days was just as tantamount to blasphemy as speaking against the temple. These people knew who he was, and they were aware of the original charges, so this wasn't just speculation on their parts. I honestly doubt that the chief priest could have arrested him in the first place if the gossip wasn't already over town. Um, of course, we don't know who started it because that was spoken privately to his followers back in chapter 13. So when Judas sold him over to the chief priest, did he share this with them? And I know what was said in John chapter 2, but Mark was the very first gospel, more of a theological you know, biography by, you know, a long shot. And John is very esoteric, heavily theological document that has to be read as such. There are entirely different genres of literature. What they do is tell the truth, but in different ways, which is exactly how people communicated in those days. When telling the stories of Yeshua, who was too complex for a basic modern history and too theological for a straight up Greco-Roman biology and too real, too tangible and present for a no-holds-barred Midrashic uh, uh, treatise. They needed to be creative in terms that the original audience could grasp and appreciate. Remember, it was written for our benefit, but it was written to them from within their specific cultural milieu, okay? And all that is to say that I am not going to take what John said into this because Mark's audience would be unaware of it. So somehow they knew about the original charges or at least the original claims. You know, in John, all that was claimed was that Yeshua said he would raise up the temple in three days, not that he would destroy it. It was more like a, a dare for them to destroy, you know, the temple, but of course, you know, he was talking about his body and they believed that he was claiming to be able to reveal the fallen temple in three days. So even if we do consider John, it isn't the same thing at all. Someone's been feeding the crowd with insider information entirely out of context, which of course isn't that big of a transgression when you're already crucifying a man whose only crime seems to be infuriating the Jerusalem elites. It would not be unheard of for those who were seeking his arrest to have been seeding the festival attendees with rumors all along the roads into town. One more thing. This is our third incident of group mocking. 
The first was at the high priest's home. The second was the work of Pilate's soldiers. And now the people passing by are heaping abuse onto him as he's dying, reminiscent of Psalm 22, 7. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. And Psalm 109, 25. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. And although it might seem horrifically barbaric that families headed to the Passover festival, you know, that they're mocking someone who's suffering so horribly, but we aren't that far removed from it at all. It's very easy to create a hardened populace. And, you know, we already enjoy watching videos of people getting hurt. People who are used to violence, and especially within the context of an honor-shame society where a shamed person becomes less than human in the eyes of the crowd, and therefore, you know, deserving of abuse, Yeshua had gone from the top of the heap, potential messianic savior, hopeful destroyer of Rome, miracle worker, and prophet, to the lowest of the low, and literally overnight. That's how that kind of society worked, and it was incredibly fickle. It's like how, you know, if a child molestation claim is made, unless it's against your pastor and the elder board covers it and destroys the family of the child, <clears throat> you know, it, it automatically gets believed and you become a monster in the eyes of everyone overnight. Uh, verse 30. Save yourself and come down from the cross. Um, excuse me. You know, the implication is clear. If you are the Messiah who is going to save all of us from the Romans, then it should be easy for you to save yourself from them. Where are all your miracles now? You know, the people coming via these specific roads were Judeans, not Galileans. They might have heard about the miracles and the exorcisms and the miraculous feedings and even raising the girl from the dead, but talk is cheap. And they were very much used to the grandiose claims of, you know, messianic claimants that generally just got a whole lot of other folks crucified. Even Augustus was, you know, dubiously credited with, credited with working miracles, and Yeshua was not the only miracle worker in those times either. Legitimate. You know, Honey the Circle Maker, you know, lived about a 100 years before. You know, granted, Honey couldn't do what Yeshua could, so I am not equating them. And it's often just a whole lot of fun to beat on someone who is much, once much higher up on the pecking order than yourself. You know, I see it among believers so often who just do not understand that it's very much a self-exalting exercise, which, you know, Yeshua warned us against. You know, just putting it in terms of recent events, I'm reminded of what happened to Johnny Depp back in 2016. An accusation was made publicly that he was an abuser and, you know, other than the films he had already wrapped on, he spent, he was like, he went for six years with almost no work at all. People were thrilled to take him down and feel better than him. Over the last few months, because of the defamation trial, a lot of the people who were destroying him are now gleefully destroying his accuser. Celebrity culture and high school culture, for that matter, is extraordinarily honor-shame-based, and people, shamefully, love watching a bloodbath as long as it's someone else's blood. And politics, too. You know? Politics still does it. Politics, high school, you know, whatever. Verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying he saved others he cannot save himself. Another reason I agree with Joan Taylor that Golgotha was at the convergence of these two roads is because if this Iron Age quarry was indeed used as an execution site, all these people would need to have a way to approach it that closely without becoming ritually unclean because Golgotha would have been considered extremely unclean. And the priests wouldn't have come close, and especially with all hands on deck and uh, everyone expected to be on duty for the festivals. Not that the chief priests would have probably been performing sacrifices, but they were temple officials. They would not take any chance of coming in contact with death. The scribes mentioned would have been those specifically associated with the temple um, administration. Um, 
These aren't just average scribes who wrote out marriage contracts and divorces and bills of sale who are yucking it up with the Judean elites in this fourth mocking of Yeshua. And it's come full circle because the chief priests were also the first group to mock him. Um, so now these were the scribes of the chief priests who, by the way, had no business being even being outside the city except to make sure that the people passing by knew exactly why he was up there, or at least why, you know, to know what they wanted them to know. This was a propaganda tour designed to justify what had been done and to fill Jerusalem with rumors, gossip, and slander, and to foment ill will against him and, you know, with the Judeans, which would hopefully also spread to the Galileans who would not, who would be you know, terribly ashamed to have even been associated, you know, with him. <clears throat> That's how shaming works, by making people so embarrassed about a person that they just want to forget them. That Christianity, you know, even exists today is more than a miracle. No one had any reason to even want to mention his name, much less preach about him. Not unless something actually happened at that empty tomb. And the priest, by the way, would have lived in the um, Herodian quarter. So they didn't have any reason to be going outside the city. So the rich folks lived. But, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to skip over the irony here. What did they say about him? He saved others. He cannot save himself. So if they are confessing and acknowledging that he did indeed save others... You know, and they're, and they're doing more than that. It's a prophetic statement that he indeed cannot save himself because if he does, then he cannot save others. They don't get it, but we get it. And can I say that with all the miracles he's been working, they might be a little bit more than relieved that his powers don't seem to work around them because if he was really the sort of Messiah that they all wanted, they would be doomed, us too, actually. Verse 32, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So, in the last verse, they acknowledge his miracles, but now they're saying that they don't matter. Because if he doesn't do something for them all to see right now, they were all meaningless. Um, I'm going to state this another way. If he doesn't come down off the cross to entertain them right now, then the works that God did through him are irrelevant. How is this any different than Mark 8, 13, 11 through 13, directly after the feeding of the 4,000? The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. As it was in Mark 8, no sign will be performed for them. There's no great mystery here. If someone wants to believe a thing, no matter how ridiculous, no proof is enough to sway them away. And conversely, if someone doesn't want to believe something... No matter how credible, no proof is enough to overcome it. All right? I've had things I have taught that were neck deep in archaeological documentation from experts in the ancient world and especially in Babylonian religion and have presented them to people who are so bought in to the propaganda from Alexander Hislop, Lou White, um... And so many others who have just regurgitated the false claims and have, you know, I've challenged people to provide evidence in context. And they can't because there is none. And they call me all sorts of names and try to undermine my character and misrepresent my motivations because on some level they need to believe it. Um, I am, of course, you know, not comparing what Yeshua endured and, you know, you know, with the challenges they threw at him with, you know, what I'm doing. I'm just saying that it's hard to get people to believe what they don't want to believe. But what they call him here is very interesting, okay? King of the Jews is a Roman title given to those few people whom the Roman Senate granted the right to rule as kings of Judea, 
um, Herod the Great and King and Herod Agrippa, I think, are the only two. But they're using Christos, which is the Greek translation of Mashiach, Messiah, and calling him the King of Israel. And this is important because now he's been given a proper title by both Jews and Gentiles. And they might have even used Mashiach. It was a common enough Hebrew word that even those who spoke Aramaic would understand. And the word for believe is psio, which uh, means not just to believe, but to trust. In other words, if you come down, then we will trust you as the Messiah, the heir of David, the king of Israel. Now, the fifth mocking will come from the Lestes, the two social bandits crucified alongside him. They were quite possibly even allied with Barabbas, but not as popular. They would have been incredibly opposed to the idea of a Messiah who embraced the Gentiles and who was nonviolent and preached forgiveness, turning the other cheek, etc. These guys would not be Sermon on the Mount supporters because they lived by the sword and they would be dying by it. Their hope... And the reason they did what they did was because they wanted violent revolution. They wanted the Davidic, violent Messiah of everyone's national dreams. And in mocking Yeshua, they become the bedfellows of Rome, the Jerusalem elites, and the temporal power players. You know, strange bedfellows, right? Yeshua is absolutely abandoned now, as far as we know, at this moment in the narrative. Everyone except for the Romans wanted a real Messiah who would slaughter the Romans, not just another messianic wannabe who would be killed by the Romans. They were all glad to be rid of him now that it was clear that he was never going to be what they wanted. If it had gone on any longer, the streets might be lined with the hanging bodies of his crucified followers and anyone else unlucky enough to get caught up in Roman anger. Um... And our next uh, one, we're going to talk about, um, not our next broadcast, but the next um, session on Mark, which will probably be in a few weeks. Um, we're going to talk about the theme of the cosmic upheavals at Yeshua's death. So if you've ever wondered about the earthquake and the grave splitting open and the temple veil tearing and, and what it all meant, what it was meant to communicate. Um, yeah, we're going to look at that from... Um, their apocalyptic point of view and how, um, what it would have communicated to them. But I'm going to do, I don't know how many weeks the series is going to last, but I really need to talk to parents and just adults in general about, um, the struggles our kids are having with gender confusion and how we are contributing to it. And especially in religious settings where we tell boys that there is a certain way for them that they have to be or they're not a real boy and the same thing with girls and you know not boys aren't all made the same and girls aren't all made the same and there are girls who are legitimately more boyish and there are boys who are legitimately more girlish and when we tell them if they don't toughen up or uh lighten up or whatever uh they're going to be gay and so we leave them no room to be the unique of individuals and and you parents know kids are born with specific personalities okay my kids you know what you see now is pretty much what you saw when they were born just a lot bigger and <sighs> but when we're telling boys and girls that when we're forcing hardcore gender roles on them, that we are precluding the work of God in their life to perhaps be making them into certain kinds of unique individuals who have to do a specific job. And when we shame them out of it, and when we tell them that, um, when we tell them that they can't be who God made them to be, yeah, they get confused. Yeah, they're going to look for a support group. Yeah, they're going to look for people who are also confused like them who don't fit in, who don't fit the mold. And if those are the people who are transgender and gay and whatever, then we've really left them with no stable foundation for being who they are. And they're at war with themselves. And this is how it 
But we're going to talk about that next week. Um, see you then. Mm-hmm.